Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Duncan Hardy. I'm a product manager at OpenShift, and I am extremely pleased to be joined today by Jan Kleinayat. I've probably butchered your surname there. Um, he was um, a manager in the developer advocate group. And today we're here to do OpenShift 4 Red uh, Roadmap update, surprisingly. Um, and some of the content in the slides does actually do that. Um, I always struggle with um, audiences like this because um, you get a kind of a mix of people that are new as Diane hinted at that don't know any, and certain individuals, and I'm looking at a certain group over there that know the infrastructure much better than I do and who give me a shiver of fear whenever they have a question to ask me later on. So um, taking forward the theory of pleasing half of the people half of the time, we'll do a little bit of stage setting about OpenShift 4, and we'll get into some of the features piece, and then um, Jan will cover the, the developer side of things. So um, what are we looking at with, as we wait for the slides to load, um, what are we looking at with OpenShift 4? Why did we do it? Why should you be using it? Um, uh, why do we use technology at all? Um, so let me go into my OpenShift 4 pitch then. Um, so why did we do OpenShift 4? We had a look at, um, we had a look at OpenShift 3, and um, we looked at the areas that we th thought that were opportunities for improvement. So the first one that kind of jumped out to us was um, just install itself. Um, and, and we could see that people struggled with this, and as soon as people actually did get an install working, then they would hit the web and start looking for best practices, blueprints, all those types of things. And that's what um, kind of gave us the impression that there was an opportunity to build in some best practice there. Um, the other thing that we saw, um, I don't know how, how many people have kind of got OpenShift installs now. I'm hoping to see some hands go up. Good. <laughs> We're in the right room. Um, the other thing, I guess, those of you on three, um, the upgrade experience wasn't great, right? It was problematic. There were so many different installs out there, so much different stuff that you could use um, that we, <coughs> you know, the upgrade experience was not good or didn't work in some cases. So we realized there was a problem there that we could also look at. And the other thing that we came to a quick realization about was that um, with OpenShift 3, we, we went out, and I hope you agree that we did well with this, to deliver the best Kubernetes platform offering to, to run your applications and workloads on. But if you look at the environment now, today, um, you will see that um, there are a few other offerings. Um, I've heard of these niche companies, um, AWS, VMware, you might, you might have heard a few of them, that are also offering a Kubernetes platform. And as we're all very polite to declare our Kubernetes bit, is Kubernetes certified, it is just what is Kubernetes upstream. So we realized that with OpenShift 4, what we needed to do was um, make sure that that environment was much more than just about that thin layer of platform. We needed to differentiate it, we needed to innovate, we needed to bring you things that we did. And hence, we got OpenShift 4. How are we doing? How are we getting there? We're getting there. And hence, we came to OpenShift 4. So all goodness, everyone raise their hands and cheer, uh, tears of joy. We really are trying to take you to the land of milk and honey. And, and what have we done with that? Well, first of all, we want to bring you a fully automated um, environment, a fully integrated environment. So we've taken every component in OpenShift and we make sure that it will work together and work well together. And that's not just about the Kubernetes layer. We've pushed down into the infrastructure itself, so we'll deploy the OS for you. We'll deploy um, onto the infrastructure and help set that up. Check out um, our internet connection down here. We are hardwired and we're not getting anything. So continue. I shall continue. I'm glad I rehearsed this only once or twice. Um, <clears throat> so um, we've got the integrated pieces together. Um, where was I? Uh, and then what next were we going to do? Um, we wanted to make sure the install experience was much better. So um, one of my first tasks, I've been at Red Hat now for a year and a bit. Um, one of my first tasks, actually all of product management and all of engineering was to go and install 4.1 before it got onto your shelves. And having come from a, a shop that used to do Kubernetes, I was set aside two weeks time, kind of worried about getting everything going. And um, actually what happened was I found out that I needed to enter, I can't remember, and I'm looking over there, is it four or five, uh, five or six questions in, into a into a script and off I went and had, I think it was quite late in the day, so I don't think it was a cup of tea, I think it was probably a beer. And within 
30 minutes, I came back and I had a three master node work in Kubernetes cluster on our AWS cloud and we were done. So the install bit was, was nice, a great experience. Um, the other thing that we did was um, to improve upgrade. So you'll see the claims, um, and this is true because I've done it myself, about one click upgrade. So we engineered the product so now that you can really hit that one click and you can upgrade your system and it will go away and do that in a nice joyful way and keep everything going nice and fluffy for you. And I can see. Yeah, let me see. I will make sure you get all the detail. Oh yes, and there's also something that you get for free. Um, and that free part is the auto, auto skill inside. So as we developed for, um, we went on and made sure that we could um, push things up and into the cloud. And you know, examples of that are uh, the machine API that we made available in OpenShift so that like you can scale up pods now, you can actually take your nodes or machines and scale those up on the fly. So um, there we go. So how do we do that? Um, so there are two extremely intelligent and articulate gentlemen in the audience are going to talk to you about operators later on. Um, but what we did with OpenShift was we re-engineered it from the ground up to use operators. And what that meant is we knew exactly what was on the system and more, and more importantly how to deploy what was on the system. Now for those of you not familiar, Operators are just um, containerized applications, but with intelligence built in. So you can take the knowledge about how to do your workflow. You can take the knowledge of some important things and build that into the product. And that's what we've done with OpenShift. And that's why we had to re-architect it. And that's why you're seeing the things that you see today. Let me see my slides, Diane. I'm trying to get your slides. <laughs> um, could the gentleman in the booth up top and come down and um, check out our internet we have no we have no internet at the desktop, but the Wi-Fi is working. Diane, I just I just talked to one of the gentlemen that they're working on it right now. Okay. Well. Alright. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Um so and I'll try and remember my slides. I, I'm going I'm to have to ingrain them onto a piece of paper next time. Um, so, um, so we've got OpenShift 4 now. Um, and we've got it working and hopefully you're using it. Um, but you're really here for the updates and to find out what's happening. So what, what are we doing? What is, what is ahead for OpenShift in the next year? So there are four areas, and I'm going to forget one of these definitely because I haven't got my slides in front of me that we are focusing on this year. The first one and the most important piece is, um, well, not actually most important, they're equally important. The first one is a little bit of a surprise. I, I don't know about out, out here, but um, certainly one of the things that we've seen is the rapid rise of telco 5G rollout. And um, is it, I always get this the wrong way around, um, network virtual functions, NVFs or NFVs, I always, always get that mixed up. Um, the telco industry has gone nuts on that and we've seen, and, and what they want to do is that because they're investing in new infrastructure is they see OpenShift has been core to running to that. So that is one of the big bets that we're taking and we're seeing a lot of investment in that. Yes, that's <laughs> Technology. Um, the other thing that we're doing is, which as we alluded to already today, is um, multi-cloud, multi-cluster federation, however you want to talk it. Again, this is another one of the big bets for us. Um, what we're seeing now is, um, you know, many use cases. The telco one is one where you might have lots of small Kubernetes clusters all over. Um, but another one is, um, you know, I've talked to many customers. They've got single, absolutely massive clusters with thousands and thousands of nodes. And they maybe want to break that down into smaller chunks, but still manage it in a cohesive and homogeneous way. So that's another one. And then, you know, again, to... Troy's talk, uh, we see a lot of customers that want to run on multiple different cloud providers or indeed on-prem and, and, um, and go into the cloud. So that's multi-cluster. Um, next on the list is just stability of the platform itself. So um, I, I do like to stand up here on the platform and make some great claims about how easy it is to upgrade with one click and then within 10 minutes someone will come up to me and say, by the way, I was doing an upgrade the other day and it failed after two minutes and you've just made all these claims. So we are investing a lot of time, a lot of effort in making sure that the platform is stable, that the experience that you get is what you expect it to be. And one of the cool things there is um, 
uh, the telemetry piece. So you know, if you're in connected mode and you've signed up to send back the telemetry to Red Hat, we have an entire team that's devoted to looking at that information. And what we find is when we do an update, we'll see some customers that, um, that kind of maybe have some problems, but they're not aware that they're having them. So we can fix them in engineering before you ever see them, patch it, and it's all done in a proactive way. Um, and then the last one, he said, drastically trying to remember what it was, is, ah, hurrah. Can I have a round of applause for IT? So, feel free to repeat anything that you'd like to, if you um, I think I've jabbered on long enough on certain yeah, things. this is the PDF. Oh, right, okay. Oh, you'll get to see some slides that I didn't want to show. Excellent. So there's the connected, cluster, uh, connected customer one. Um, oops. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Um, and then the last one is um, to drive workload and usage. So this is what uh, Jan is here to talk about. Um, we've already alluded to this as, as well, developers. But the next generation of developers are extremely important to us. And we want to make sure that we capture all of them. So what about OpenShift 4.3? Um, that um, launched yesterday. I don't know how to define your definition of launch. You could have downloaded it on Friday. Um, the announcement went out yesterday. The press release went out a couple of weeks ago. Um, there were three areas that we kind of went into um, as a focus on this. So the first was inst uh, the installer customization. So um, one of the things, that, and I'm looking around the room at certain people that I definitely got beaten up about was disconnected environment and install. When we did 4.1, that was just connected only. Um, so we've done some improvements there. Um, and I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail later. Um, security and compliance was a focus for us. I am unfortunately old enough to remember when security was the last slide in the deck and no one wanted to talk about it. Now we all realize it's front and center. Um, so, you know, a lot of effort there. Um, FIPS validation, encrypt at CD. Um, we've also moved on to have Kubernetes 116 as our base. And the last piece is improved networking. So we've focused on high performance networking. Um, the one that sticks out for me there actually is um, the high performance multicast. So that's really useful in IPTV and conferencing. So we did have a multicast solution, but it was pretty low bandwidth, pretty low performance. So we've gone ahead and addressed that with the help of SRIOV, which is now GA, to give you customers the opportunity to use that in those environments. So let me take a breath and slow down and start to talk about some of those things in detail. So install upgrade, we always, always get asked about um, which providers we, we support. Here's a quick list. Um, this is pretty thin in 4.1, but um, you know, now I think you will agree that the major ones are up there. As Diane's already said, um, Microsoft Azure and IBM Z, are those are the ones that are going to appear in 4.3 for the users you keep in close watch. Um, anyone that's bought the Kool-Aid so far and busy downloading 4.3 onto their laptop to try out, you'll not see those yet. They're going to be in a Z stream that we'll get a little bit later on. Um, I do you want to talk about upgrades? Um, has anyone looked at the, how you get OpenShift these, these days? In 4.2, we introduced um, the idea of three channels. There's, there's actually four, really, though it's not an upgrade channel, so we'll talk about that, too. Um, candidate for 4.3, seen as it's G8 now, probably not interesting, but we'll have one for 4.4. So that gives you a little bit early access to the release before we kind of fully G8. There's a fast channel. Um, as soon as something GAs, as soon as the patch is ready, that goes in. Um, so you can get it straight away. That might be just a little bit churny initially. You know yourselves when a new release comes out, we kind of do some fixing together with the telemetry that we use. Um, so uh, that's interesting. And then there's a stable channel where we deliberately step back, take a breath, see how everything goes, and then we'll push out kind of a lump in a more stable, updated way. The fourth way is um, anyone been on to try.openshift.com? Ooh. Ooh. Joy, if you want access, we make our nightly builds available there now. So if you want to go and get 4.4 now, get on try.openshift.com. All you need is a login. Um, for example, I look after storage, the CSI snapshots, functionality, tech preview has just gone in there. So you can play really on. It's really good. Likewise with the candidate, good for test environments. I, I wouldn't be putting it in production. Um, disconnected, so in 4.2, um, just to go back, we made the idea of disconnected start to work. And how we did that was um, by 
essentially, in a simplistic way, because my mind is simplistic, is we allowed you to take a copy of our container registry and essentially stick it into your air-gapped in environment, and we updated all the dependencies and the operators in there, allow you to grab it from there. Likewise, for updates, you just pull the updates down and update the registry, so that's nice. Moving on to 4.3, um, as you alluded to on the slide before, we've got um, enable some private-facing endpoints. So when you did a 4.2 install, um, the ingress load balancer, for example, would have a public-facing IP. And there were certain customers, as you can expect, were not very happy with that. I, I mean, you could with originally just go in and, and do you know, the day two operation, switch it back to being private. But some customers wanted it to have a totally private install. So we've enabled that piece. Um, we've also done, and I can also forget the, the second one, but VNets and what the, uh, whatever the other one is, thank you for that line, Patrick, um, we've also enabled that so you can use existing ones in the infrastructure rather than having to create new ones. Um, and we want you there. Um, as a slight aside, um, I, you know, everyone's got a past. I used to work on a product where we, like with OpenShift, we didn't enable you to move from one version to the next in the form of an upgrade. And there was a lot of teeth gnashing and fingernail biting and a lot of anger about that. But what I found after a while is once people got over that, that little bump and actually moved on to four, the anger was directed me in the way that, why did you not make us move to this more quickly? Our life is so joyous now, tears, everyone wiped them away, that, um, that we should have been there much quicker. And this is the moment for OpenShift now. So four, three is out. You know, we've got through the kinks that you might have seen earlier on. We've got a feature parity on the most important things. Your life will be much better. You will be able to enable your team to work, stop worrying about the drudge tasks of the day and focus on the important things for your business. This is really time to move. We've got an app that will help you do that. Um, what I like about this is we did look at doing an upgrade from 3.11 to 4.1. But it was going to be a lot of resource, and it was a one-off engineering exercise. With this app, we envisage you continuing to use this. So you have your upgrade linear process for 1, for 2, for 3, for 4, for 5. But say you maybe want to stick on 4, 2 for a while, and then you suddenly realize, actually, I want to move to 4, 5. This will be the app that will help you do that. So it's a good investment for us in that it's something, a tool that you can continually use, but also for yourselves, and it gives you flexibility of what you want to go and where. Day two management, um, another slide I didn't want you to see. Um, this is about security. So um, FIPS certification, I don't know whether that's very interesting here. Certainly our North American partners were asking for that. Maybe once we get a US trade agreement this year, and maybe it'll be more interesting to us. Um, the other one that stands out to me, um, a little bit of a, the dog ate my homework, is encrypt encryption of etcd database. We had that in 3.11. We couldn't do it in four. It's there now, so we've caught up. Um, FIPS certification, wasn't going to show that one. Monitoring, lots happening in monitoring. Um, again, if we could, uh, between us, Jan and I could probably do a whole day on what's in new in OpenShift. Um, but what's nice here, tech preview in 4.3, you can bring your own monitoring um, Prometheus services under the OpenShift umbrella. So if there are things that you wanted to capture before that you couldn't, now you can bring that into the umbrella. This, you know, this is one of those things I'd really encourage you to try because we're actively looking for feedback for how this works and kind of to improve it. And then last, and only two minutes over so far, is multi-cloud. Um, this is huge for us. Um, I look after the Federation team. And what we realized uh, several months ago was that we were kind of working away on our bit and the storage people were doing some things and the networking people were doing some things and OpenShift Dedicated were doing some things, but we didn't have this coordinated plan. And that's been rectified. And there are key areas now that we're focusing on. And like the telco, this is another area where we've done massive investment. There's a team being specif specifically spun up for this and a number of engineers I'm not going to say it in front of the camera, but come and talk to me when we're having coffee is, is astounding that we're putting to invest on this project. And there's some key things in there that we know now we need to address. So the provisioning, getting your cluster up and running, the, and the life cycle of it, how you manage it through a UI, how you do the monitoring and logging, so the, you know, the Prometheus stuff that we talked about, um, down to the job deployment and policy pieces and the infrastructure itself. And the thing that, are, you know, if you remember one thing from my section today, because I'm a multi-cloud bigot, 
is that what we're doing in OpenShift now is just like we did this tide change in install in four, is we're now looking at every component in OpenShift and saying, okay, that has had a single cluster view to have. For those components, what does it look like in a multi-cloud and multi-cluster environment? And we're going through those steps now. Um, specifics, um, so um, I hate putting numbers on slides. I forgot to take that off, because um, you'll just complain at me if you don't hit the 4-4 target. But we've got something called Hive, um, and this is an example of what I've talked about. So we had the machine API that allows you to roll out additional machines and scale them up and scale them down. Hive, once you have your initial cluster, OpenShift cluster, will allow you to say, set up your YAML file configuration and say, give me 20 more web hosts and clusters and it'll go and spin them up for you. Um, and we're gonna integrate that with IBM MCM. Talking of which, um, one of the big things for me was when we started talking to our IBM colleagues is we noticed that IBM MCM is a jolly good solution. It actually does a lot of the things that we were thinking about how we're gonna get from A to B on this already. And for those of you already with a contract with IBM and you have the multi-cloud manager in your environment, there's an open shift plugin for it and you can go away and manage now and get an advantage of all these things that you already do. Um, on the Red Hat side, what we're doing is looking at how we can work with that team um, and take things and reinvigorate the communities that we are and bring more of it open to, over to OpenShift. And you'll see some more announcements on this soon, I'm sure. Um, Multi-cluster networking, another one I wasn't gonna talk about because otherwise John will not talk at all. Um, my last slide, um, GitOps. Who's interested in GitOps? Yeah, excellent. My buzzword of the year. Um, we, we talked to pretty much all the GitOps communities, and I think it was Jan's team that actually came out with the content that I'm talking about, but um, Argo CD seemed like the best fit um, and for us, you know, just where they were going and what they want to do. So there's a bunch of content on the web available now. Really simple, um, search for OpenShift Argo CD, and there's blogs and how-tos about how to get through and get this working, and, and you know, we're gonna look at how we integrate things more openly. You know, we've chosen Argo CD, but we are saying we're kind of GitOps vendor agnostic, so you should be able to prove, you know, if you've got Weaveworks or something, you will be able to plug into us, but right now we're starting with those guys. And only five minutes over the time, which is hopefully is not too bad, I will hand over to Jan to talk about the really important stuff, which is the developer side. All right, thanks. Thank you for being patient with our slide difficulty. So, the, I'm going to cover two sections here. One is the first, which is going to be some of the tools and services that are on top of OpenShift uh, that are intended to help developers be more productive. So some of what we'll talk about there is service mesh, serverless pipelines, and then some of the code-ready tools and other developer tools. So we'll get right into it since we're running a little late. So Troy touched on service mesh a little bit. Um, what's important for you to know that came out in 4.3, uh, or approximately in the same timeline as 4.3, is uh, OpenShift Service Mesh version 1.1. That's coming in February. Um, some of the key things to note about that are that it's um, upgrading the version of Istio that's being used to 1.4. Um, there's also something that's coming. We're going to talk about the OpenShift console updates at the end. Uh, but one of the features that's been added to the OpenShift web console is the ability to um, directly link to third-party dashboards and things like that. So you're able to link more easily to like the Jaeger Kiali dashboards from within the web console um, in this new version of Service Mesh, which is a convenience. Um, other things to note, so with uh, Jaeger, you can use this with an external version of Elasticsearch. So if you have an external version running, you can use it with that now. Um, moving on to serverless. So serverless, since OpenShift 4.2, there's actually been two major versions released, so there's been a lot of progress and work going on there. The 1.3.0 version is available now, I believe, and that is upgraded to using Knative um, 0 0.10. Um, it's a lot easier to install Service Mesh. How many, have any of you tried installing it so far in the past? A couple. Well, 
If you haven't, then just appreciate that it's, it's much, much simpler now. Um, in the past, you had to um, install a bunch of dependencies, install a bunch of other operators, um, such as service mesh under the hood before you could use serverless. Now it's just a one-click install, and the OLM dependency resolution is what allows us to basically do that. Um, so now you install it, and it's going to install Istio and Jaeger, or what, all the other things that it needs in order for you to use serverless. Um, so you should check it out. Yes. So, so you're saying it's tech-free, so what's the aim for GA? I believe our very last slide has the, the, the date on it. I don't recall the version off the top of my head, but I, I think we have that on at the very end on our like overview roadmap slide. So I can, I can point that to you um, at the end there. But yeah, several of these features are in tech preview. If it has the red banner up there, it'll, it'll designate tech preview or dev preview. Um, depending on the current state of it. OpenShift pipelines, I believe, I believe it was Troy that may have touched on this as well. So OpenShift pipelines is built on top of Tekton, which is an open source project um, for doing cloud native or really kind of Kubernetes native CI CD. And what's cool about it is that it really is, it's built for containerized applications, but it's also a containerized solution itself. So the way Tekton works is it brings some additional custom resources into Kubernetes in the form of tasks pipelines, things like that. And so you can create these CI CD pipelines um, in Tekton and they um, kind of run in a, in a very Kubernetes native kind of way. So there's no CI engine. It kind of runs serverless in that sense. Um, using pipelines is going to allow you to use pretty much whatever Kubernetes tools you want to use to build images and plug that into your pipeline system. So you can use things like S2I or Builda. You can also use build packs or whatever um, works for your workflow. Pipelines, one of the features about, about Tekton and therefore OpenShift pipelines is portability. So if you create these pipelines, it's not just going to work on OpenShift, it'll work on any Kubernetes distribution, um, which can be really helpful if you're trying to use things in an extensible way. Um, it also supports reusability, so there are catalogs available of tasks that you can import and use um, in your own pipelines, which is nice. So OpenShift pipelines is available in Operator Hub now. Um, and it also, we also have been doing a lot of work on the Tekton CLI, um, which you use as part of managing this. In addition, recently there has been a Tekton Pipelines VS Code extension. So if you're using VS Code, this is available in the marketplace. This kind of builds on some of the Kubernetes extensions to allow you to create triggers, um, manage your pipelines and things like that from within VS Code. Um, and then, of course, we are still supporting Jenkins. Um, some of the updates there, so the Jenkins server now supports JDK 11. It also does still support JDK 8. There's an environment variable that you can set um, to specify which one you want to use. There's been a couple uh, agents updated for, again, JDK 11 and also Node 10, um, since Node 8 is end of life, I believe. Uh, and there is an official Jenkins operator and operator hub also. And that is developer preview on uh, 4.3. But you know, please try it out. Let us know if you have feedback. That's something that you know, we're collaborating with the upstream community on. Um, and it's pretty exciting to see it there. Next, we'll talk about a couple of the developer tools um, and code ready, the code ready suite of, uh, of tools that are out there. Um, there's more than I have time to talk about here. So I'm just touching on a couple. Um, one is Odeo. Out of curiosity, have any of you used Odeo or Odo, OpenShift Do has many names. Just a couple, okay. So what this is, I'll give you a quick overview. So it is a command line tool that is really focused um, for developers who are doing that kind of inner loop development. So maybe you're not even ready to commit these changes yet, but you're doing some, some development. You want to see how it's working, but you want to see it actually running. Um, this is going to abstract away some of those Kubernetes and even OpenShift concepts that developers may not really care to have to, to know in depth in order to be able to get that iterative development loop going. Um, so you can see from the screen, hopefully you can see from the screenshot here, the, the syntax that you use with ODO is, is kind of a very familiar type of language. So, you use create to create a component, push to push your changes, 
And then you can use things like link to link a front end and back end component, create a URL. Um, and then my favorite part is this watch command, which when you're running watch, it'll sit there and look for changes to your local code. And as there are changes, it will push them up and deploy them. So you can see within a very short period of time from when you, you know, make a change and save it to when it's running um, on your cluster. So around the 4.3 timeline, there's been the most recent release has been a lot of fixes for stability and, and issues that are reported from customers. Um, so there's quite a few things fixed there. Um, the output that you see when you're showing a list of supported components has been improved to give you a little bit more information on kind of what levels of support for different components. Um, and then we're also focusing now on some additional new use cases, um, specifically around Knative additional runtimes that, that Odeo can support and things like that. And then finally in this section, code-ready containers. So if you're more familiar with OpenShift 3, you've probably encountered ManyShift, where you can you know, basically run a single node cluster on your laptop or desktop to do local um, development work. So in the OpenShift 4 world, the analog to that is, is pretty much code-ready containers. So this, again, will allow you to run OpenShift on your laptop or desktop. If you go to try it at openshift.com, you can download it there. Um, and in the 4.3 version, there's been some improvements uh, that really make it a lot easier to use. Specifically, this first one here, automatic certificate rotation. This smooths out a lot of hiccups that, that people were encountering before. So this basically will just keep it, keep it running a lot more smoothly over time for you so you don't have to deal with certificate issues. And other important notes here, um, if you had tried it in the past, there's been a lot of fixes around networking that will allow this to be installed successfully and work as you expect in a lot more networking configurations, especially if you do a lot of customization on your laptop around networking, uh, you'll have a better experience now. So CRC, Code Ready Containers, uh, it's great. We definitely love your feedback on that as well if you try it out. Just briefly going to breeze through this content on Helm here because we don't have a ton of time. So Helm 3, if you're familiar with Helm, it's basically a, a way of packaging and installing applications. Um, Helm has been around for a while. What's different about Helm 3 is that there's not the server side component anymore, so Tiller is no longer part of it. Uh, and on OpenShift, we're including Helm 3, the Helm 3 CLI, in Tech Preview in 4.3. So you'll be able to download that. This is a very tiny screenshot. But on the command line tools page where you download OC or ODO or things like that, you can also get the Helm 3 CLI. Um, so that is built, ooh, I almost tossed that, built and shipped with OpenShift. Um, the documentation is there as well. And in, in future versions 4.4 and onward, there's going to be support in the dev developer perspective of the web console as well for, for Helm charts, for releases, and things like that. So it'll be additional integration to make it even more visible and easy to use in future versions. Uh, I'm going to skip this section because we've got some folks talking about operators later, but I just want to clarify that sometimes when we talk about Helm, there can be a little bit of confusion because it sounds like some of the, it's some, blah, 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 sounds like it's solving some of the same problems as operators, but they really kind of live a bit separately. So Helm is really focused around the packaging and installation, but not really that day two automation of you know, those operational tasks that happen over time. That's where operators really shine. Um, you can have Helm-based operators, but even in that case, it's not going to give you the full life cycle that, that, you know, other types of operators can do. So they're not two things doing the exact same, solving the exact same problems, if that makes sense. Okay. Console, we got about five minutes here. I think we can do this. So when I talk about the console, I'm talking about the web interface for OpenShift, so the web console. I'm not sure how many of you have actually hands-on used OpenShift 4.2. Some, okay. So if you haven't, um, something really exciting in 4.2, we're talking really about 4.3 in this presentation, but I want to make sure that you're all aware. Um, prior to 4.2, in OpenShift 4, there was one web console, and it was really very administrator focused. Um, in 4.2, we released a, a perspective model. So there's an administrator view, but you can toggle and go to a developer perspective, 
which is really very application focused. We've got some screenshots here in a moment. There's a topology view that can show you what you've actually got deployed in a project. And then we surface some of the things that typically going to want to do in the, in the tasks that they perform on a regular basis. But you're not locked into that. You can toggle back to the administrator view if you have more um, operational tasks to do. So these are some of the features that have been added to the web console in 4.3 that we want to touch on. Um, this is a project dashboard. So this is giving more visibility into what's going on in your projects. There's a bunch of widgets here that you can drill down into. Uh, if you can't read them, kind of what you see is project details, status, inventory of what, what things are actually running in your project. So you can click in and see your deployments, pods, and so on. Um, there's an activity log on the right-hand side. And then we mentioned the the links that you can have, like for Service Mesh, for example, to have embedded links in the console. You can see in that launcher section on the top right um, what that would look like. There's a launcher link there to open um, Service Mesh. I'm really excited about this one. So we have the ability now, and, and not just we, but you all and vendors, have the ability to add YAML samples into the web console. So if you are creating custom resources. You can include YAML samples so that when your users are trying to actually deploy whatever the thing is, they have an example of what that YAML might look like so they're not having to always jump out and go to some documentation to see, okay, how do I actually create this resource? What are the different parameters I need to, need to deal with? So that is really exciting, I think. Um, and I think that getting this in place for many of the operators, particularly ones that are out there um, in the community or an operator hub, will make life easier for when you're trying to actually deploy these things. Uh, this feature here, uh, I'll, I'll just start off by explaining. So this is for um, things that are hosted in Quay. Specifically, we have the ability to view security vulnerabilities within the web console. Um, so that's using Claire. In the future, we hope to expand to other vendors, things like Twistlock and, and Aqua and so on. Um, and again, for currently, this is only working for images managed in Quay, um, but it's pretty cool. There is a new user management section. I'm also excited about this. So to kind of simplify the user management and group management process, we've broken out under the user management section, users and groups. Um, so it was very... Um, just the pure RBAC specific kind of menus before. Now we've got users and groups and it gives a little bit easier way of, of managing that. Uh, also this is a feature to impersonate a user it can be really helpful for troubleshooting um, if you're trying to understand a particular user, what can they see and not see in the web console, you can do that now. You can set up alert receivers. This is kind of the first step in the process here, but to make it more efficient and more actionable for people who are receiving alerts in the system, rather than receiving all the alerts and having to kind of filter through what's important, you can set up alert receivers to only send alerts for certain things to certain um, sets of people or certain applications. Right now it supports pager duty and also webhooks, uh, but we hope to expand, expand that to things like Slack and so on in the future. There's a couple things here around deploying applications and making that process easier. You can now deploy images from an internal registry, which can you know, be a lot more efficient. Um, we also added in support uh, in 4.3 to auto-detect the builder image. So when you're deploying something from a Git repository, it'll auto-detect if it's Node.js versus Java versus something else. So it just saves you a few clicks there. And then this is an exciting change too. So when you are deploying something now, in the past it would default to using a deployment config. And you didn't really have an option to change it. So now you, we're going to default to a pure Kubernetes deployment, but you still have the opportunity to select deployment config or um, a Knative service as well. So you have a lot more flexibility in how you, like what your deployment target is than you did in the past. Should point out that, that Knative is still in tech preview, but you do have the option to do it. Okay, this is a sort of a screenshot of the topology view that I referred to in the developer perspective, um, which shows you what you've got deployed, um, some of the features that have been added in 4.3. You can toggle between this topology view and a list view of the same um, information, which, you know, if you had 
40 things deployed in there. It could be a little overwhelming, perhaps, to look at 40 different circles. Um, but you could look at a list view to quickly find what you're, what you're looking for. You can more easily group applications. And now you can also, and an application is, you may not see the contrast here, but there's like a light gray um, circle around a group of these nodes on the topology view. And that denotes an application conceptually. Now you can delete an entire application, and it will delete all of the components that are within that grouping. Um, and then there's some features coming in around binding, so being able to inject configurations to connect like a front-end and back-end component, for example, to make that a little bit easier. Within the developer perspective, we've added project details and project access, just to say if these are things that we got feedback that it would be nice to have this surfaced here to prevent having to flip back between developer and administrator perspective for some of these more commonly used tasks. So this is going to allow, um, from the developer perspective, to look at project details, but also to share your projects. So if you want to share a project with others in your team, um, the most commonly used uh, roles are available there, so you can give edit access or view access or whatever um, for your projects from within that menu. OK, last one. We're only a few minutes over. Last one is metrics. Uh, so Duncan, you mentioned we could probably talk about all of these types of things forever. We could talk about metrics forever. But I will just point out this little bit here. So within the developer perspective, we're surfacing um, a metrics tab. Right now, it's just kind of a this is like step one, basically. So there's a dashboard here of some of the most commonly um, used metrics. You can also use Prometheus query language to, to look for whatever you care about. But um, I expect that this will probably continue evolving over time. As with all of the things in Tech Preview, we'd love to get your feedback on what would be useful for you to look at um, in this developer perspective as far as metrics go. And then. I did mention that there was a slide, oh, I don't know if anyone can read that, um, from the audience. But this is kind of a breaking it down version-wise. So 4.2 has been out since October. 4.3 just very recently came out. And then 4.4 onward, we've got the features that are coming there. Um, I forgot which feature we were asking about when it would be in GA. It was serverless, perhaps. Um, yeah, 4.4. Four. The plus means probably 4.4, four, four, but, <laughs> but um, I can attempt to get you more specifics around that if you catch me later in the, in the afternoon. All right, Duncan, did you have any other things you wanted to add? All right. No, that was good. That's great. So I'm going to make them stay on stage for a few more minutes. Um, and Jay's, there were a couple of hands. OK, we're doing really good with tech stuff today. Um, Jay's going to, I'm going to give him a microphone and let him run and ask a couple questions while I bring up Christian, who's going to hook up his machine. And here's one more here, Jay. And so if you have a couple of questions while we do this rigmarole with a different laptop, um, please do ask these guys, And because I saw the hands go up a few times. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, with Odo being around for a while, in 4.3, are we looking at OC deprecation, or are they going to be complementary? OK, so no. We're, we're in, OC and ODO are both important, but they serve different purposes. Um, so there's not any plans for OC to go away. Um, OC allows you to do a much broader range of things than ODO does, and that's intentional. So ODO is really meant to focus on that inner loop development um, and to kind of do it in a way that abstracts away the having to know what a deployment is, what a pod, what a service, what a route is and so on. So it's not intended as a replacement for OC. It lives alongside it as another option. Do you have an offline deployment? Code Ready workspaces, so the, the web-based IDE? Yes. OK. Oh. Because currently in 310, mm -hmm. um, you do need all the repos and stuff available. So. Disconnected. Okay. Um, so, sorry. I don't. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find out unless yeah, you know. The disconnected stuff. I have a mic. <clears throat> the disconnected stuff is fairly new, so kind of evolving. Um, all of that 
disconnectedness, that air gappiness. Um, all that's already coming over for a lot of other things. Any, for the most part, things it relies on will come if you're using weird Maven repositories or something like that. I mean, once you're talking about workspaces, it kind of blows up from there. Um, there's gonna be some manual work there to bring those particular repos over, but just in general, it should run inside of a disconnected system. Um, again, assuming you've, you've taken the dependencies you needed. It'll have the baked in run times and things like that. Kind of depends on how complicated you get things. Okay, so, um, and I also just, um, hold your thoughts. We, at the end of today, we are gonna bring everybody back up on stage for an AMA session, um, and everyone is going to be here during all of the breaks, so you can ask them questions there too. So we'll have a big chunk of time. I promise I'm not even gonna do my, my roadmap closing talk. We'll just stretch out the Q&A at the end. So. Um, uh, find these people on the breaks, ask the questions, and ask you know, further follow-up questions during the AMA. So thank you for your um, tolerance of our AV issues. We're gonna walk through OKD4 now with Christian Glombeck, who's come to us from, from Berlin. <laughs>